Good morning, church. Or should I say good morning, glorious church? Because we are continuing our series this morning entitled The Glorious Church. Now, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room. I did say to Gareth last week, John brought a brilliant word to us. It was fantastic, really, you know, inspiring about helping us think about our role as the church. But I got a little bit distracted at times, to be honest, because of the graphics up there behind me. Did anybody else be honest? You know, the guy with blue hair and the lady with her shoulder pads that are bigger than her head. I was like... They're great, Gareth. They're really great, but they were a little bit distracting, weren't they? So we've acknowledged that they're there. So have a good look now, and then we can focus and move on, right? (laughs) Just to say, if anyone wants to take this off Gareth's hands, I'm sure he would willingly receive that offer. So the glorious church. On a more serious note, let's acknowledge at the beginning, from the outset, that the reality of the church around the world and in our in our country, in our city, has not always seemed glorious. John touched on this last week, you know. The reality of church has sometimes meant that there has been pride and greed and lust and abuse and cover-ups even within the church. This grieves the Father's heart. These things, they are wrong And they are not from God or of God. So I believe that they grieve his heart. And yet, the amazing thing is that God, the church, is God's plan. The church is God's plan A. I don't believe he has another plan. But I also don't believe that God is pacing and panicking right now thinking, I've got to get up, come up with another plan because the church are letting me down. No, I believe that God is still on the move and he is still using his church even through the imperfections. I read a quote and I'm not sure where it's from, but it said, the only time you'll find yourself in the perfect church is when the Lord returns and makes all things new. Until that time, gather with the imperfect church for Christ will be in her midst regardless of her imperfections. I believe sin in the church grieves the heart of God and yet God delights in showing mercy. You know that the gospel, the power of the gospel is needed within the church as much as it is outside of the church, right? We need to learn how to apply the gospel within the church family. We have to learn learn how to apply God's grace and his mercy within it. You and I growing in wisdom, growing in grace, and most of all, growing in love. Love one another were the words of Jesus to his followers. In John 13 verse 34, Jesus says, love one another just as I have loved you. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Why? Why are we to love one another? I'm sure we've all asked that question at some point in church life, right? God, why? Why do I have to love that person? That person? It's really difficult. Why? Why do we need to love one another? Well, first of all, I believe it's what Jesus said, because he has first loved us. You might hear the phrase, love is love. You might see it on posters in schools. You might see it written on pencil cases or on the back of somebody's rucksack. Love is love, they say. But hang on, because if love defines love, then that means it's as flimsy as my feelings and changeable. No, the Bible tells us that God is love. God defines love. He is love. He's not just loving, but he actually is love. And that's good news for us because God is faithful and God is good and God is strong and he's unchanging. 1 John 4 verse 8 says, God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. As we have been loved, we now go and we love others filled with the love of Christ in us. 
Is it easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. (laughs) Because of the spirit of God, a gift of God living inside of us. It means having the Holy Spirit living in you means that you can love beyond your natural means. You know, there's this self-love movement around at the moment, which encourages you just to love yourself. Because how can you love others if you haven't first received love? But you see, for the Christian, it's different because we have received love. And we've received love from the perfect source, which is God himself. That love is what motivates us to love others. Now, just don't hear what I'm not saying here because there's a bit of a nuance. This self-love thing is not the same as taking care of yourself and putting in maybe some um, limitation, recognizing your own limitations and your need for rest or good food or company. That's self-care and that's good. But self-love is a different belief. It's one that says, I have to muster this love from within me. And if I can't love myself, then I can't love anyone. And I want to suggest that actually God is your source of love. You don't have to muster a love that comes from your imperfect self, but you can have the perfect source of love flowing into you and through you. But what about self-hate and self-harm? You know, am I condoning that? No, what I'm saying is that those things even fall at the face of the love of God. When we experience feelings of self-hate or self-harm, the answer is not just to muster more love from within us, but it's to receive more love from the perfect source. As we receive his love, it frees us from this self-striving and his love begins to flow into us and through us towards others. You know, that's why it's really good to know the word of God because We hear and we see a lot of these slogans today, and they can be quite convincing. But when somebody's telling you that you love because you love yourself, you can say, no. I know 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. So why do we love one another? Because he has loved us first. We also love because it makes us more like Christ. Do you know what God wants for you? He wants to make you like his son, Jesus. And here's the tough thing. He might actually put you in situations. He might actually put you in church alongside people that really rub you up the wrong way. And it brings all your imperfections to the surface. Why? Because he wants to deal with them. He wants you to see those things and surrender them to him and allow him to remove them so that you become more like Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, you have heard love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say love your enemies in Matthew 5, verse 43 to 44. But enemies are always outside of the church, right? Well, no, <laughs> Sometimes we will find that we are required to love our enemy even within the church. And you see this amazingly outworked in the early church. Have you ever considered what it must have been like for Paul to come into that setting where the early Christians are forming the early church? And perhaps picture him sat around the table with the other Christians and there and he's teaching them about breaking the bread and about Jesus' blood and his body. And as he looks around the table, he sees something familiar. There's like a look in somebody's eye or a a smile that he recognizes, and he thinks, is that the mother of the guy that I persecuted? Is that the brother of the guy that I stoned? You see, the early church would have been this eclectic mix of really imperfect and difficult people. Not just Jews, as they may have hoped, but also Gentiles and persecutors sitting with those who'd been persecuted. How were they able to sit at a table and form this thing called church when there was so much that divided them? Well, I wonder if it's because they also pictured another table that they'd heard about, where Jesus sat at a table 
And he shared that meal with the one he knew was going to betray him. And he shared it with the one that he knew that was going to deny him just when he needed him. And because he sat at that table and he broke that bread and he said, that's my body, it's broken for you so you can be whole. Not just whole in yourself, but whole with one another too. And this is my, bo- uh, sorry, this is my blood and it's poured out to wash you clean. So this eclectic mix of people with all their hang-ups and their, and their hurts were able to come and sit around a table together because of what Jesus had done. You know, Jesus' love for us cost him greatly. And sometimes our love for one another is going to cost us greatly. And we've got to trust God that when we love one another well, that he is working all things out for our good and for his glory, even when it hurts. Becoming like Christ is good for us. So therefore, loving one another is actually good for us too. So we love one another because he first loved us. We love one another because we become more like Christ and we love one another also to make him known. Jesus said, love one another just as I have loved you. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I read a quote that said, a church that is missional and wants to make Jesus known in their community must be a church that loves one another. I believe it's really good to reach out, to do outreach things, to to share Jesus' love with our community around us. In fact, Gareth and I, we moved into the neighborhood in our our previous location where we used to live. live. We moved into the council estate and we loved the people around us. And I have to be honest, there were times where I loved reaching out to those around me, perhaps sometimes more than I loved those within the church. And I know that sounds awful, but I'm just being honest. I think perhaps because sometimes we can hold people to a lower standard if they're outside of the church, maybe, and we hold them to a higher standard inside of the church. And so, although I love my friends within the church, perhaps when it was difficult and somebody, you know, was rubbing me up the wrong way, I found that harder. And I just wanted to reach out and show people Jesus' love outside of the church. But I've had to grow in that. <laughs> and God has shown me that, no, you have to love within the church. Because otherwise, what are you bringing people to? If there is not love amongst us here, then it's kind of fruitless and in vain to bring others in. We have to love one another well in order to be missional and love the world well. As the church, we see what love is like through reading the Bible, right? But the world sees what love is like through reading the church. And man, I don't feel up to it sometimes, do you? I know my weaknesses. A genuine, costly love for one another is so hard. But yet, I know it's possible. Because Jesus wouldn't have asked it of us otherwise, would he? Is it easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. Through the power of the Spirit. As we love one another within the church, those outside of the church begin to catch glimpses of what Jesus is like. And it spills out and begins to be the experience of love from God that they so need. So why do we love one another? To make Christ known for the sake of the world. We also love one another for the benefit of the body of Christ. I heard this testimony from a Bible teacher named Megan Fate Marshman, and she tells the story of how she tragically lost her husband when he died of a heart attack aged just 36. She tells the story of the days following where she began to struggle to sleep at night. She said that some of her friends became aware that she wasn't sleeping. And one of her friends, particular friend called Mandy, went to God in prayer and asked, can I just carry some of this for Megan? Can I just carry a portion of what she's carrying right now? The next day... Megan's sister came to her and she said, how are you doing, Megan? And she said, I slept. 
and Megan's sister burst into tears. I said, what? You slept, Mandy. Sorry, you slept, Megan, because Mandy didn't. Wow. Mandy had asked to carry some of what Megan was carrying in her grief. And Mandy had gone without sleep so that Megan could. You could argue, couldn't God allow both of them to sleep? Well, yes, of course he could. But how much more loved did Megan feel because Mandy had gone to God and said, let me carry some of this for her. She experienced God's love through the body of Christ. And Megan says she has come to this understanding that the body of Christ is all of us, but it is actually also sometimes us being like a physical body for one another. You know, when you share tears at my grief, it's like your tears are those of Jesus. When you wrap your arms around someone, it's like the arms of God. When you go to somebody's house when they really need you, it's like God showing up on the doorstep. You know, we get to be the body of Christ to one another. And body parts, they have really different functions, don't they? And some have different strengths and weaknesses. And as the body of Christ, we get to strengthen what's weak. And we also have the opportunity to just lighten the load for somebody. We can bring out the best in others, can't we, through our encouragement and speaking out truth that we see in someone and investing in them. All these things, they are building the body of Christ as we love one another. You see, love, it has practical outworkings. It's not just a feeling. Love actually looks like something. So maybe like Mandy, God may place you to walk alongside someone through their grief. And it might mean not going to the party when you really want to, but sitting with them instead. That might be how God asks you to love someone. God may ask you to be the answer to a prayer for someone, rather than solely just praying, but also using what God has already given you, like your resources, your time, your money, your car, a skill that he's given to you to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. Perhaps you're a married couple or you're a family today and you might be able to come alongside someone who's single and you champion them in their walk with Jesus when it gets lonely. Maybe you can extend love to somebody in the church family who's very different from you. A teenager coming alongside them and encouraging them. Perhaps it's sitting with somebody who's elderly. What if for you it's just arriving a little bit earlier? Or staying a little bit later just so that you get to know other people and you find out how you can love them and be loved? Could you love somebody else by checking in on them with a particular sin struggle that they're going through and being willing to stand there and believe God's best for them and keep them accountable and ask difficult questions because you love them? Love one another just as I have loved you. Your love for one, one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Is it easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. But it has to begin in our hearts because it's not just a feeling and it's also not just somebody telling you to do it. It has to be a loving conviction of the spirit that moves us to love one another motivated by God's love. It says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14, let love and kindness be the motivation behind all that you do. I kept reading that verse over and over again, and I was thinking, that is a great prayer, isn't it? Lord, let love and kindness be the motivation behind all that I do. And you know, as we make space for love in our hearts, the love of God, we have to let go of things that we're holding on to. I felt very challenged about this myself. There are things actually that can hinder God's love flowing through us, like pride, protecting myself. You know, what actually if I allow myself to be vulnerable to somebody? And that's hard. I would rather maybe protect myself. Other things could be unforgiveness. You know, I've got so used to holding on to that grudge and holding that thing against somebody that actually I don't really remember what life is like without holding on to that thing. And so having to let that go in order to let God's love flow through me maybe feels a bit scary. Perhaps it's apathy. You know, I'd rather just sort of just chill out, you know, not give too much to anyone because 
makes me vulnerable and maybe apathy sometimes has a root of fear as well. You know, there are things in our lives that perhaps God is stirring in us right now to address that we have to let go of in order to love others well. These things are real struggles for us as humans. Jesus knew it. He died for us to be free of these things. So are we willing? Are we willing to make space in our hearts for God's love? I'm going to ask the band if they would mind coming back up. And we're going to respond this morning because... I can speak about loving one another, but we really, this is something, like I said, that has to just come from within, that we have to allow God to do within our hearts. So let me ask you this morning, how do you feel like you're doing in this area of loving one another? Loving others when it costs us or when it hurts. If you're able, would you stand to your feet with me?